science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. It's good to be back in the swing of things. Um, It was pretty fun being back at school with my new students. Adam's excited for grade 12. Chris has this new position at the high school. I guess the only difference is the dogs are home alone more than they normally would be because Chris has been teaching in the pandemic at home for the last two years. It's okay. (laughs) We sneak peek in on them while we're away and they just sleep. And Chris said that's exactly what they did when she taught from home, is they would sleep the whole day away, especially Bunsen. So nothing much has changed. Very exciting news. Texts from Bunsen, the ebook that Chris and I have been working on all, all summer is done. It's very hard to describe to people who don't follow Bunsen and Beaker on Twitter. I make these jokes every week where Bunsen texts somebody from the family And they've become this really heartwarming segment that a lot of people connect with every Friday. And it was suggested that we make a book. And you can't just make a book. You need a publisher. But So we decided to self-publish an e-book. And Chris and I worked really hard all summer. And boy, did the e-book turn out so good. Um, So in the show notes, there's going to be a link to get on the the list for the ebook our our pre order pre order folk got it already and they just love it so much and it makes it makes me so happy to hear that so that's the exciting news from the family the text from Bunsen ebook is done and oh man um after this I've got to start working on the audiobook and that's going to take about a month so it's a big job but I'm excited to do it Let's take a look at what's happening on the Science Podcast. In science news, we're going to take a look at how some ants live longer than they probably should. Very cool. In pet science, we're going to look at a study that basically took the number of dogs in a neighborhood and showed how it correlated to deviant behavior like crime. It's such a cool study. Our guest, our guest is the amazing Dr. Sebastian Ball, and this is very cool. He he studies cats, and he was so kind to us. He sent us samples of catnip and catnip-like plants, and for about two weeks, we're going to be doing a tournament with Ginger about which of these plants she likes the best. So next week, we'll let you know how the tournament is going on the Science Podcast. Hey, dogs, what color is a cat's favorite color? Purple. <laughs> okay, that one's that one's really bad. Let's do two. What What is a cat's favorite alcoholic drink? <laughs> a Meowtini. Okay, on with the show, because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, let's talk about ants. This study came up on our feed, and it was timely because I was out with Beaker moving some rocks, and I overturned a rock, and there was ants everywhere. And I don't know if Beaker knew enough to stay away from them. She's curious But I think she's a little bit cautious of insects after she got stung by wasps last summer, like about 12 times on her head because she got too close to a nest. I felt so bad for her last summer. So insects, unless it's like a fly, she kind of is wary. So she watched the the, she watched the ants scurry around from a little bit further away. So our study comes to us from. Our study comes to us from a new journal entry in science in early April. It talks about why queen ants can live for so long when all of the other little ants don't. What's going on in a queen ant to make them live so long? 
Now, of course, there is the biological reason that the queen is the, the, the ruler, and it's in everybody's best interest that the queen stays alive as long as possible. Researchers looked at an anti-aging factor that these queen ants have compared to wannabe queens, and they found that it's insulin. I confess, I don't know a lot about ants, so... <laughs> As I was doing some research and, and doing the background on this study, um, it's I, I just keep blown get blown away by ants um, all the time. Maybe you've seen some of those videos where um, I, I think hopefully it's not the worst ever to explain, but people pour they melt like aluminum and they pour it into an ant colony. I think it kind of kills all the ants, but it solidifies and shows you what the ant colony actually looks like, and they're huge. And it was a specific type of ant they looked at called Harpagnathos saltator. Hopefully I got that right. Anyways, the what, what piqued their interest was when a, a queen dies, a bunch of the female workers start dueling <laughs> to replace her. These ants throughout their duels start to develop ovaries and they can actually start laying eggs. And they form queen-like ants called gamer gates. Okay, when one of these female ants turns into this pseudo queen, their lifespan gets longer. So that's where we start is what is making like if this and then if the Gamergate ant thing becomes a queen, it lives even longer. Once the dueling process is over, the losers revert back to a worker and then they go back to living as long as a normal worker ant. So one of the conclusions of the study is that it these gamer gates and queens extend their lives by basically changing the insulin pathway in their body. It's interesting that other animals besides humans have insulin. And I think if we think about humans, too much insulin is not necessarily a good thing. It's good to regulate our sugar, but elevated levels of insulin in humans, just like in ants, decrease how long you're going to live for. Specifically in the pseudo queens, there is a molecule called IMPL2, which effectively binds to insulin and shuts the insulin pathway off that's linked to aging. At the same time, other genetic pathways in the queens, the pseudo queens body ramps up like it's time to start thinking about making a little ant babies and laying eggs. This other pathway shuts off. That increases the length of the ant. And it's so bizarre. Can't, could we take a look at how ants extend their lives by shutting off insulin with humans? Well, we do have different biological needs. Um, I think if you just shut off insulin in a human totally, you'd die because you wouldn't be able to uptake sugar. And we kind of need sugar to stay alive. But maybe there's a way that we can learn from these ants and apply it to human biology. What the team suggested is, is kind of interesting in their conclusion that, well, IMPL2 regulates this insulin pathway. They don't understand how or why it does that. They're like, oh, it does it, but we don't know why. It's very interesting. This aspect of ants isn't seen anywhere else in the wild that they know of. So it's unique to ants. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's look at this really interesting study that linked dogs in a neighborhood and crime. We've mentioned it before that Bunsen is this big, lovable teddy bear but people that he doesn't know, when they come to the door, he barks. He's a watchdog, and he's big. He's huge. So to, unfortunately, the Amazon or male people, he sounds like he's going to eat them. And Beaker barks too, but there's no way Beaker's bark really sounds all that threatening. And as soon as people come into our house, both Bunsen and Beaker want to see them so bad and be their friend. So, especially Beaker. Um, if somebody was to break into our house with nefarious purposes, I think Bunsen would probably rise to the occasion and drive them away. Beaker, on the other hand, would be so happy to see burglars and murderers. Uh, she'd be like, oh, good. I love your hockey mask and your machete. Come right in. Um, that's Beaker. <laughs> 
So this study was conducted in Columbus and what the researchers did is that they took at neighbor they took a look at neighborhoods with dogs and saw if there was a relationship between the number of dogs and crime rate. Now, why would there be less crime? Things like homicide, robbery, aggravated assaults. If dogs are inside the house, they weren't looking at break and entering. They were looking at robbery, murders, and assaults. And the the interesting conclusion is is that the more dogs there are in the neighborhood, the more people that are going to be outside walking their dogs causes something called eyes on the street, which discourages crime. This was stated by Nicole Pinchak, lead author of the study, who who was a doctoral student in sociology. You may not think it, but when you're walking your dog, you're, you're in a sense patrolling your neighborhood. I'm sure, like, we don't live in the city, so this doesn't apply to us farm folk. Um, But I would assume that people have a certain path that they take their dogs on a walk because Chris and I have a path that we take Bunsen and Beaker on. Now, it's not throughout a neighborhood. It's through the boonies. Uh, (laughs) But I would assume there's like a certain route that you take every day. You get to know who's on your route. You get to know what's going on your route. And it's a huge deterrent for crime. So the statistics come from census. So the study tried its best to put the two together. They looked at crime rate statistics from 2014 to 2016 in these neighborhoods. And then they also looked at other studies that asked residents if they had a dog in their household. An interesting extra thing to note is they also had a third variable, which is data from something called the Adolescent Health and Development um, Context Study. Basically, it measures trust in individual neighbors. So the part of that study, residents had to rate how much they would trust people on their street. And in the past, that was a huge factor in how much crime was in your neighborhood. The trust you have in your neighbors deters crime in your neighborhood because it's like you're going to help out folks around you if something goes south. So here's a couple things. To nobody's surprise, the neighborhoods that had the most trust in each other had the lowest levels of crime. The neighborhoods with the highest concentrations of dogs showed an additional drop when compared to those with low concentration of dogs. And then when they factored in high dog ownership in high trust neighborhoods, the factor was even more. So it probably has to do with trust and dog walking. Other parts of the study that was probably no surprise to folks is that if you have dogs in your house, there is a very decreased chance of property crime, like somebody breaking into your home. Any kind of size dog seemed to have an impact, even like a chihuahua. I think I'd rather go up against an angry Bunsen than an angry chihuahua. Um, And this protective factor of dogs within to help property crime and the factor that protected homes with dogs was across the board of all factors like poverty, socioeconomic status, um, single parent families. So the dogs had a uh, protective effect there. One of the points the study made that was really wholesome was that dog ownership is great for your mental health. You get more exercise, but an unintended consequence is dogs could make your neighborhood safer. That's pet science for this week. Hello, everybody. The Science Podcast will always be free to download and listen to. You'll never have to worry about paying for it. But we have some amazing ways that you can help us out with running the show. The first one is to think about becoming a patron on Patreon. And we call our patrons now the Paw Pack. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of awesome perks and different tiers of support. We also have a very detailed and excellent merch store. And if you're listening to this in time... We have pre-orders of the Bunsen 2.0 stuffy that was just adorable. Um, You can check it out. There's also the Beaker stuffy on our store and a whole bunch of comfy clothes. The third thing you can do is give us a good rating. Rate the podcast wherever you're listening to this. We'd love to get a great rating from you. Okay, back to the show. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast. And I have Dr. Sebastian Ball, research scientist with me today. How are you doing today, Sebastian? 
I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited because what you study is right up the alley of the science podcast. No pun intended with alley. Um, <laughs> uh, but one of the things we ask our guests right off the top is, uh, where are you in the world? Where are you calling in from? Uh, right now, I am in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Um, but we live in Maiko, which is a small uh, semi-rural area just outside of San Antonio. Right. And the reason I'm, I'm in San Antonio right now is because I work three and a half days a week at the University of Texas Health Science Center. Mm -hmm. And in my free time, I do what I call my hobby research at home, which is Cowboy Cat Ranch. <laughs> um, I love it. It's a, um, a ranch style house with uh, some land and we live there together um, with seven adopted cats. And with we, I mean, um, my wife and I. <laughs> so you're in Texas for a job slash research. Did, are you from Texas originally? Uh, we kind of spoke before that, you're, that you probably moved there. Yeah, I was born and raised in, in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And um, about 11 years ago, my wife and I moved to the United States. So um, I introduced, introduced you as a doctor and you're a research scientist. What's your education? What's your educational path? Um, I went to, um, to college and I got a, a bachelor degree in nutrition. Hmm. Um, then I got a master's degree in medical biotechnology. And um, I did a PhD in virology slash genetics at the University of Amsterdam, which is where I met, well, met my wife, Evelyn. And then uh, together we moved to California to do uh, postdoctoral research uh, where we studied the malaria parasite. Mm -hmm. And um, five years after that, we moved to Texas where she started her own lab. And I told her that I would be willing to help her as long as she would allow me to do some of my own research. In my <laughs> time. Kind of uh, you scratch her back, she'll scratch yours kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> what got you into science? What was the thing that got you into this path of nutrition and then research? The, the, the reason I got into nutrition was because I've been vegetarian since my early teens and okay, yeah. vegan a couple of years after that. So I was always interested in, in nutrition and learning how to be able to live vegan, uh, cruelty-free, yet still be, be healthy. Mm -hmm. And then after I got my bachelor, I just gradually rolled into the next thing I did. I just continued with what I felt was the, the next logical step. So a master's degree after my bachelor, and then after my master, I, I, I uh, pursued a PhD. Um, I do remember uh, at college where uh, one of the teachers was explaining how clinical trials worked and he touched on placebos and control groups. And, and I found that extremely interesting. And um, I, I think that's, that's one of the things, one of the reasons I, I got excited about, um, about science. And then later on, I, I learned that um, evidence-based veterinary medicine isn't really a big thing yet. So I, I was kind of disappointed with that. And um, also lack of, um, lack of reliable information was mm -hmm. another motivator for me to, to start doing my own research. That is so interesting that it snowballed from one area of science into another. Um, it's very interesting. I've talked to scientists for years now and that's a common thread. They're like, you know, I, I was doing a thing and then somebody mentioned something and then, and then, then I was like, why not me? <laughs> so it sounds sort of like you there with uh, the, the second part of your science career. Um, yeah, and, and my, my, I, I don't come from, from a family of people who did uh, research. So I, I, when, when people ask me what I wanted to do um, later in life when I was, when I was a child, it, it never even crossed my mind to be a scientist because <laughs> I, I don't even think that I knew that was an option. Right. Oh, that's so fascinating. So let's get into kind of the, the exciting stuff that you do that's related to what we talk about on the podcast every week, which is science and animals. You do research with catnip, but also other plants and their effect on cats. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about that research? Yeah, so it, it all started with us adopting cats and we decided to keep them indoor only for many reasons. And with that, we wanted to make their life inside more interesting. So obviously 
Uh, a lot of people with cats know about catnip. We bought a catnip plant and uh, we bought uh, dried catnip from, from the pet store and we gave it to the cats and absolutely nothing happened. Oh. So we were rather disappointed. Yeah. And I started to do some research um, online, obviously, and I, I found some anecdotal um, information, some stories from other people that were suggesting that there are, are other plants as well. But there was absolutely no scientific data. Um, no one has ever done a study where they really looked how many cats uh, responded to to some of those other plants. And for us specifically, more interesting, if you would look only at the cats that don't like catnip, um, are, the, are there cats among those that maybe are interested in some of those other, as I call them, cat-attracting plants? So we did a study mostly with cats in uh, non-kill shelters back in, in California, where we had four different plants. One of them was catnip, and then uh, the other ones were silvervine, which is a kiwi plant, okay, um, uh, a honeysuckle, the Tatarian honeysuckle to be specific, and valerian. The, oh, valerian. The, the okay. roots. Yeah, the yeah. roots. <laughs> and we we gave those four different plants to 100 cats in total. And we've done that on numerous times. So, we, you know, if they didn't respond on a certain day because they were not feeling well or some other cat uh, um, you know, interfered, we would offer it to them again a couple of days later and we would make sure that they had plenty of opportunity to respond to it. And we found that of the 100 cats that we, that we tested, um, 30 of them had no interest in the catnip, even after really? we gave it to them several times. And this was also published somewhere in um, a scientific paper in, in the 60s. So this was, it was nice that we found approximately the same, the same percentage. The, in, the interesting part is that of those 30 cats who showed no interest in catnip, 80% of them did like at least one of the other plants. Um, and out of the 100 cats, 95 responded to at least one of the plants. So this shows that not all cats respond to catnip, but there's a, a, a pretty big chance that if your cat doesn't like catnip, that some of the other cat attracting plants um, might be really loved by the cat. Really? That's so fascinating. So that was the first the first study that we did. And then, um, as I told my wife, I wanted to do a, a quick follow-up study which turned out to take five years. <laughs> uh, and we, we recently submitted the, uh, the manuscript to, uh, to a journal. Hopefully it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out soon. Because um, when, we, when we gave the cats all those plants, it was more of a binary study. It was, do they respond or do they not respond? Like a yes, no. But we never really looked at the, at the behavior um, so much itself. Like how long do they respond? Are there differences? How do they respond? So we decided to focus on uh, six cats uh, living with us. So we knew a lot about the cats, uh, also about their personalities. We added another plant, a little bit more of an obscure plant. It's called Indian nettle. Um, and we gave, it, we gave five different plants, uh, each plant on 10 different days, 10 hours a day. So a total of 100 hours. And we collaborated with uh, fantastic people in, uh, in Australia from the University of Western Australia in Perth. They actually synthesized a dozen of molecules, which we suspected may um, be able to, uh, may be responsible for the response that you see in, uh, when, when the cats um, smell those plants. Mm -hmm. And in general, um, the, the cats loved all the plants equally. There was not a plant that that stood out uh, more um, uh, compared to the others, uh, which was an interesting finding by itself. It, it shows that catnip definitely is not king or queen in in the in the you know the the field of cat attracting plants. The other ones are absolutely loved just as much. Um, and it did seem when you when we looked at the cats individually that some had a preference for one plant over over some of the others. <laughs> And um, there were there were quite some differences in in um, how long they responded to him, oh. but the, one of the most interesting uh, uh, things was also that we did see huge differences in how the cats responded 
uh, to the oh. plant. So one cat really responded different uh, than, than the other cat. And this is something that we really didn't know. We didn't know if the response was biologically hardwired or if there was a variation between cats. Ever notice when you go outside, there are all those birds chirping and flapping around out there? What's their deal? Well, find out with me, Ivan Philipson, on the Science of Birds podcast. We cover topics like bird behavior, anatomy, evolution, and conservation. Sometimes the focus is on one group of birds, or even a single species. If you're into birds, or if you just love learning about nature, the Science of Birds podcast might be just perfect for you. Find the link in the show notes or go to scienceofbirds.com. So interesting. So catnip is not unique in like it's the only plant that has that effect. Can, can I can I ask a couple follow-up questions? Absolutely. Okay, so the first one, and forgive me if you explained it and I missed it, is why do cats act the way that they do around those plants? Like, what is it that makes them go bananas? Yeah, so that's that's actually one of the motivating, uh, one of the, the questions that's, that motivates me, why I'm, I'm still not giving up on this research, uh, even though we published, the, we, we hopefully soon uh, have the results published. I want to continue with this uh, with this um, uh, field of science because we simply still don't know. Um, it's it's it seems that it's a fortuitous um, uh, response, so it's more coincidence um, and not so much a biological reason. And it's it's fascinating to me personally that we know about this response for for a long time. But it's not really; it hasn't been studied um, yeah. at all. But imagine that. I, I mean, what happens is that cats are drawn to it. Um, it's it's voluntary. They they love it for typically one to fifteen minutes, depending on on you know the cat and how long it's been since they've seen it previously. <laughs> um, they they start rubbing. They they appear uh, to enjoy it a lot. And it's there. There are no negative side effects whatsoever. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is uh, I'm sorry, I cut in there, but like, there it doesn't appear that it harms cats in any way for them to interact with this stuff. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I, I, I can touch upon that um, um, question actually uh, because it's 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 very important. So, but. Uh, to go back to, to what I was saying, hmm. imagine that we could find something for humans that way, right? Like such a blissful response, such a euphoric response without any negative side effects. But the, the, the question uh, that, that you had is, is, a, uh, is a really good one. Um, you know, is, is, it, is it good or bad for, for a cat? You know, are there, are there any negative so- associations? Because people do associate it sometimes with drugs, with being high, being stoned, tripping, and a lot of cat owners uh, or cat caregivers, uh, as I prefer to say it, they, they do feel bad about giving it to the cat for that reason, because of that negative association mm. with, Stigma. With, with drugs. Absolutely. Mm. Um, so we looked into those molecules and the size and the structure of those molecules that are responsible for, for the response. They are n- not similar at all to um, LSD, cocaine, THC, um, whatsoever. And... The mechanism by which it works. So, cats, the reaction is elicited when they smell it. So, it's not injected no. in the blood. It doesn't have to be in the blood, which is true for you know for all the human <laughs> drugs. Yeah, um, it's not addictive. When when you take it away, uh, we don't see any signs of them being upset, <laughs> uh, except from, except right at that moment. You know, they're enjoying it. Like, hey, why do you take it away from me? Right, they're just puzzled. Um, yeah, no and important. It can be stopped, right? If if someone is stoned or uh, or high or tripping, it's not something that can be stopped. It usually takes many hours. Um, right. Whereas this, you you see them respond. You take it away. They're like, "Hey, what?" And then they're normal again. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's a cat response. <laughs> <laughs> that is fascinating. I never right because like, can you imagine if humans smelt something and they went as bananas as cat did for catnip, like? I like 
you know, certain food smells, but I'm not going to go roll in them or, <laughs> you know, you know, like you smell lavender, like, Oh, that smells good. Or vanilla. Oh, that smells good. But I'm not going to go roll around in it. Exactly. Know? And it, it might, it might simply be that they don't have that filter. Um, you know, maybe we smell something really good and, we we would feel like rubbing it and and you know rubbing it all, all over our body and rolling in it. Um, I don't know. Maybe we're you know limiting our, ourselves, but yeah, they kind that's, of like social structure not to do that in public. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like when you're filling up your uh, your car with gas, I, I personally love the smell of. Oh, it. I love the smell of filling up the car with gas. Yeah, it would look so weird if you start rolling around on the floor. <laughs> well, also it'd be dangerous. True. <laughs> I don't know. Freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. That's a pretty good smell. And all of this drives you to know more because you just don't, you don't have it quite figured out yet. It's not something that is known. Um, is that, am I getting to the right, the heart of it? Yeah. So, so the interesting thing and um, so, so with vision and, and hearing, we, we, we understand how those, um, uh, how those work, right? It's like wavelength and frequency, et cetera. When it comes to odor and smelling things, scientists still don't have a clue how it works. Oh, we, no. We don't understand why a molecule is shaped in a certain way, how that can make us smell pear. And when we change the molecule slightly, we smell, we smell banana. Right. We have no clue between what they call the structure um, um, odor relationship. Right. Which is which is absolutely fascinating. Um and we also don't really know anything or or hardly anything about odorants, so the molecules that that are responsible for the smell of something, uh to which receptors they bind. Also for for all these molecules. So maybe you um um you've heard of napetalactone. It's um the only it's been the only compound so far that has been shown to be responsible for for this response, but we don't know which receptor it binds to. So one other thing that I found personally very interesting um, about the research, uh, the results that we that we have from the research that we've recently done, is we gave um, the cats thirteen single compounds, so so s- molecules, and um, they responded to to all of them. So instead of just napetalactone, it's about a dozen, at least a dozen molecules that are responsible for this response. Now, most of these molecules were very similar in structure to napetalactone. And there were three cats, three siblings, two sisters and a brother, who always responded to all those plants like quite excessively. They, they loved it. They were more, like, more extravagant um, than the two other cats. But then... There was one molecule, and instead of it having a um, oxygen um, atom, it had a nitrogen atom. And mm. the three siblings did not like that molecule at all. Oh! And uh, there was one cat who was not too enthusiastic about the other molecules. <laughs> she absolutely loved that other molecule, which is called actinidin. And this suggests that there may be more than just one receptor involved in these molecules that can elicit the catnip response. Hi, this is Ross, the host of Smells Like Humans, a show about interesting and quirky human behavior. We bring humor, empathy, and warmth to topics such as relationships, dating, work, self-compassion, weddings, phobias, aging parents, travel mishaps, death, and many more. Ever wonder what happens at a cuddle party? We talk about it. Free-range kids in restaurants? We've got some thoughts. Bedtime stories for adults? We're on it. Light, fun, unscripted conversation and personal stories. Please join us by clicking the link in the show notes. It's so much more complicated than I ever would have thought. Um, Like, I come from chemistry, and, like, we teach in high school chemistry, the structure of esters, right? The esters, you know, there's molecules that we smell. And I didn't, I don't even think of like how you smell (laughs) just that this is the chemical that makes the smell. Yeah. And then on top of that, I know with humans and and I know with dogs, cause I've, uh, I've done some study research on that. Like 
it elicits memory as well. Like smells elicit memory. So it's binding to something and bringing up something in our brains to remember things. And I imagine yeah, I, it's the same way with cats too. Yeah. In, in general, smell is, um, is very special. It's um, I, I still experience it uh, on, on a very frequent basis where I smell something and it, like you mentioned, it, it brings back certain memories. And I, I think it's, it has huge potential also with people who are, um, uh, is it Alzheimer? Like dem mm, yeah. Dem yeah. Dem dementia. Dem yeah. Dementia. Yeah. Um, I, I think you can reach people, um, especially because those might be able to trigger like, like memories that are very relevant for them by having them smell things. And I'm, I'm really curious. I don't even know if it's happening or not, but, um, some, some sort of smell therapy sounds, um, very interesting for, uh, for, for those people, I would say. Well, even, uh, I have read that they're, they're like, they're in the infancy of studying smell therapy with, uh, people who suffer from PTSD, right? Mm. Like you're having, you, you're having a bad memory. You switch it out for a smell that is associated with a good memory kind of thing. So, yeah, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I also personally love um, fragrances, and I don't know if if I can address this, but um, we I read a paper in um, in a, in a journal. It was published somewhere in the nineties where they did olfactory enrichment for big cats. Mm -hmm. So this whole catnip response is not just limited to domestic cats, but it's, it is also, um, it, you see the same thing with uh, bobcats, mountain lions, um, lions, and interestingly, the tigers are quite different, um, cheetahs as well. So what they did is they, I think they tested about 30 or so uh, perfumes, fragrances um, on, a, on a bunch of cheetahs. And um, we picked the four mo most interesting ones, so the four that they that those cheetahs liked the most. Um, and, and that was because they started, they, they both started rubbing the object that was sprayed with the fragrance and they spent most time to it. And I was wondering if, if cheetahs like it, how would the six cats that we studied so intensively, would, would they like it as well? Um, one of them is uh, Kelvin Klein's obsession for men, which is um, <laughs> not, uh, well known uh, for, amongst people that do olfactory enrichment for big cats. Apparently a lot of them like it. Um, the six domestic cats, they couldn't be, uh, they were not interested at all. Oh, so um, e. Calvin Klein. <laughs> they did not like that one. Um, and then uh, there was just one cat. And again, it was the, the cat who also liked the actinidin. Um, she really likes Dracon Noir. Oh my goodness. And the response was, was very similar. The behavior that we, that we saw, it was a lot of head rubbing, some licking. Um, <laughs> so it was very similar to, to the, uh, to the cat attracting plants and also the, the, the single molecules. So that was very interesting. And then clearly we were, um, uh, curious to see if that fragrance had the, uh, the actinid in, in it. And so we had it analyzed by our collaborators in, uh, in, um, in Australia. And unfortunately that was not detected. That would have, that would have made so much sense, right? Because she was the only cat who loved the accident and she, and she also was the only cat who, who liked the, uh, the, the fragrance, but we were not able to detect any, um, any of those compounds in that perfume. So, Again, that raises the question, is it just, uh, do they just simply like the smell and is it different from cat to cat? And they just, when they like a smell, that's how they, that's how oh. they respond. That's how they behave. Right. Um, or is it, or is there an, a, a, a certain molecule in there that we were not able to detect because it looks different than what we think it should look like? We, 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 yeah, we still don't really know. It's absolutely fascinating. I can see why you're so curious to know more and understand more. It's just, there's so many unanswered questions. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating. I love it. And I want, I, I do want to share um, with, with you that um, recently in uh, last year, a paper was published by a, um, a colleague who has been um, doing very interesting uh, research in the, in the past as well. And they claim that, this response um, happens because it's a way for cats to defend themselves against mosquitoes. Um, oh. 
we we know that the compounds uh, in these that are responsible for this behavior do have an effect uh, on on uh, on insects. They they deter it. Um, the issue that I have with this conclusion, though, is that if that would be the case, you would expect a lot more animals probably to show similar behavior. Mm. Um, plus, it's not there are not a lot of diseases that are transmitted by insects from cat to cat that have uh, huge negative health effects on them. Plus, they're covered by a lot of fur most of the time. So, yeah. Well, it's like Bunsen. When I take him out, he's our burner, our Brains Mountain Dog. He rarely gets bit by mosquitoes. Like, good luck getting through all that buzz <laughs> to any kind of like bitey place. But yes. if I go outside today, like we've had rain for like three or four days, I get eaten alive by mosquitoes. So, yeah, yeah. So I guess I better just put on some Draquan Draquan Noir. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's so cool. You know, people who are listening, they they could probably do their own little experiment with their cats at home, right? They could Absolutely. take some Calvin Klein. They could say, take some Draquan Noir, um, spray it on a thing and see if the cats enjoy it or not. Absolutely. I, w- I do want to stress, and, and it should be unnecessary to mention this, but please don't ever spray perfume or anything like that on the pet itself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But um, yeah, you, what we, you, can, you can simply get a sock and just spray it on there. Um, don't give it to them straight away because there, there will be some ethanol in there that will need to evaporate first. Yeah. They might not like it. But yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, the same is actually true for um, other plants. Uh, that, that you that you suspect uh, that you've seen your cat respond to, and if you can take a video and share it with me, that would be fantastic, and we might be able to include it in future research. I love it. Okay, so I will do the call to action when this podcast episode comes out, Doc. Um, I think people would love to do with our reach on Twitter. You might get hundreds and hundreds of videos. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. And, okay, and all right. I, I, I don't. I don't think that. Um, so, so right now we've identified six plants with these with these compounds, but I'm pretty sure there's you know there's 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 more of them. Uh, yeah. I, I have no doubt. But and it would be it would be very interesting to to know. Uh, and we can do chemical analysis, um, which we've <laughs> also done for for these five plants. Um, that way we can really measure how much and which compounds are are present in those in those plants. Hmm. But the video is very helpful because we've, okay. we've had we've had people um, make claims, um, mm. but actually actually seeing it uh, helps a lot because sometimes, and that was one of the, one of the big issues with with older um, publications um, about this this topic, is that it was not very well established on forehand when they did those research uh, experiments what was considered a, a positive response, a catnip, a catnip response. Sometimes people even just mentioned uh, if they would bite an object just once, that would be considered the catnip <laughs> response. But it, it really needs to um, involve some, uh, some serious head rubbing. That's probably the most important one. Right, yeah, maybe the cats are curious. Like we have a, a cat now and anything new, our cat Ginger, she's just going to come check it out. So it could have been a false positive for their interaction with the catnip. And if you see it and you're like, yeah. Oh, well that's consistent with what we know now as a positive interaction. Yeah. I can totally, I can totally get. And what, what people, what people can always do, what would help even more is to, you know, if you would give that sock to, to the cat um, at the same time, give another sock where you did not spray the, the fragrance <laughs> on, just oh, keep them cool. a little bit apart. And that way, you know, that would help us, to discriminate between is it something that's specific to what you sprayed on the sock or is the cat simply interested in in just because it's a sock? So we have a couple standard questions we ask our podcast guest, and um, the first one is for a pet story. Now, um, we've been talking about pets, aka cats, for a while, but do you have a pet story that's memorable from your life that you could share with us? Are you an engineer, want to be an engineer, or would like to know how engineers think? Hi, I'm Aaron Moncur, host of the Being an Engineer podcast. We've created this podcast as a central repository for industry knowledge and best practices to accelerate your learning curve within the discipline of engineering. We've interviewed over 150 top performing engineers, including those from MIT, NASA, Apple, and even YouTube sensation The Hacksmith. Find us, the Being an Engineer podcast, with the orange and blue logo on your favorite streaming service. Again, that's the Being an Engineer podcast. I, 
I, as a child, I, I grew up with, I remember one or two bunnies, maybe one or two guinea pigs. Um, but we never, I never had a cat or, or a dog. Um, there's two short stories that I would, that I would like to share though. Um, the first one is about cowboy. Um, and that's the reason why our research institute and, and our home is called cowboy cat ranch. Um, cowboy was a, um, a, a very thin black cat who participated in the first study on, the, on the catnip that we did, uh, back in California. And when I was visiting the, the shelter, he was always the first one to greet me. Uh-huh. He was, um, absolutely adorable, um, but very sick. He had, uh, he had heart disease and, um, just a few days before we moved to, um, to Texas, uh, we heard that he had passed away. So mm-hmm. in, in memory of, uh, of this special, special cat, we decided to, uh, call, uh, call our place Cowboy Cat Ranch. And, um, the second story is, is about, um, um, a cat called Pumpkin. We, um, shortly after we moved to Texas, I went to, uh, the local shelter, uh, just to, help them with some enrichment to, to sh- pretty much to share the story about catnip and silver vine, et cetera, to trying to make the cats happy. And there was one cat out there and secretly without my wife knowing it, I was uh, looking for a cat. Maybe we could, you know, we moved to a bigger house. Maybe we could adopt more cats because when we moved from California to Texas, we had five cats. Um, and, We've, I, I hadn't seen the cat before and I brought out the silver vine, just a very small bag, like half a gram of, of powdered uh, silver vine is in there. And all of a sudden there she was, um, a pumpkin, uh, a, a little bit too big, um, a torty, uh, torty shell cat. So the name was quite suiting because she looked a little bit round and she absolutely loved the silver vine. And we spoke to the people of the shelter and they told us that, Usually she she doesn't do that. She doesn't come uh, to people. She's not very active. She usually just stays high up there hiding. And it really was the silver vine that um, drew her from high up to uh, to to um, you know to us uh, because she was so into it and it was really attracting her literally. And she was uh, I would say maybe uh, thirty feet away or so from us. Uh, so I thought that was very special. And she was in there for a long time. It was not a very nice shelter. It was kind of cold and sterile, not a lot of uh, uh, nice fuzzy places. And um, she was diagnosed with uh, cardio, um, like heart with heart disease. Mm-hmm. And turned out that was fal- false, false positive. Uh, they did an echo and they saw something. Um, we've had an echo done again by a, a very, very good veterinarian. And her heart is absolutely fine. Uh, that was six years ago now. She's still super healthy. Um, but that was pretty much the reason why we met her. And, and that's how she ended up uh, as cat number six at our house. I love it. What a cool story. Using the science of cat attracting plants to make the life better for another one. Um, so the second standard question we have is something called the super fact. It's something that you know when you tell people it kind of blows their mind a bit. Could you share a super fact with us? Um, yeah, there's there's some small things. I wouldn't say it's a super fact. Maybe it's uh, it, it might blow some of their minds uh, <laughs> a little a little bit. Um, uh, we have more than forty five cat trees in our house. Um, on average, I make a hole um, in a wall uh, one point five times each year okay. since, since I've had this house because I, I like to make cat portals, which are very small um, uh, um, holes in a wall that, you know, you can make look nice that pretty much connect rooms at uh, an, an elevation of about eight foot. So the cats can move from one room to the other. <laughs> I love um, uh, but I, th- I think the st- a story that I recently heard, which I think is is very fascinating. Again, this is something to do with fragrances. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, ambergris. No, sorry. I don't know. So ambergris is a, um, uh, um, a compound that is used in, uh, perfumes. It is of animal origin. Me being vegan, I typically don't like that. I especially don't like musk, uh, civet, et cetera, because it's, um, 
personally, I don't really like that they uh, keep animals to, to just obtain those uh, things. But ambergris comes from the sperm whale, and um, it is an animal that eats a lot of cephalopods, um, like octopuses, and they have beaks. Um, you, can, you can look it up. I also didn't realize that for the longest time. But those cephalopods have beaks, pretty much like parrots. Ooh, yeah. And they don't digest that. Um, those parts of those of those animals, so that accumulates in their digestive tract, and they they don't really know if that gets at some point. It's you know it starts to build up and build up and build up. Um, it's still not really known if at some point they will poop it out, or if it will um, if the if the sperm whale dies from it and then it gets released because you know, at some point it, it is released from the body over time. Um, but that stuff, that material floats uh, um, uh, on the ocean for, for years, sometimes decades, until it is found by people on beaches. And um, it is sold for a lot of money. It is very, very precious. And it smells really good. <laughs> really? Um, yes. It's like some weird oily substance that washes up on the beach. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it happens quite often that people confuse it for some um, petroleum jelly. Um, but uh, every now and then it, it is real ambergris and it's extremely expensive. You can sell it for a lot of money. <laughs> and they identify uh, they identified a compound, which I think is called ambroxide, um, which is responsible for most of the, of the, of the smell. Uh, I really like that. There's a, a fragrance out there called Molecule O2, which <laughs> is uh, pretty much ambroxide with ethanol. It smells uh, quite good. Um, so if you're interested, you can you can um, maybe see if you if you can find that online, order a small uh, size and, and smell it. I personally haven't been able to smell ambergris myself because it is so expensive <laughs> and so so rare. Um, but I, I thought that was an absolutely fascinating story of how you know all the weird things that humans are using to to mix in a fragrance um and that you know ends up smelling really well that is a super fact that reminds me the very first podcast episode i ever did i did a story on artificial vanilla and how they used to express some kind of musk from the anus of beavers way yes. back in the day. And then that's where the original vanilla started from. Oh, um, really? Yeah. It was like the, <laughs> they couldn't get the, the vanilla bean. I guess it smells very similar to the, like vanilla extract, but it's not, not done anymore, obviously. Um, and again, I don't know how much you could get from a beaver butt, but yeah, it's so wild. The smells that we come up with and where they come from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating. And, and this is one of the reasons I, um, when, when I grew up as a child in, in the 80s, that's where I started listening to music and started to develop my own taste for music. Um, it was very special, right? I, I would see a clip on MTV and, and, and I would be, oh, I, I really like this song because I couldn't play it on demand. Now I noticed that um, it, it music has really devaluated because if I want to listen to uh, a certain song, I go online and I can listen to that song. Now, what is still so nice about fragrances is that you cannot smell it when you're online. You still have to go somewhere <laughs> or you have to order it, wait for your package, and then you can smell it, um, which for me is, is, is one of the reasons why it's still so special because you, you, know, you have to put in effort. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I really like that about the whole smell thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, the West Coast of Canada has a smell. And when you get off the ferry and you get far enough on the West side and you smell that, you know, basically the, the Northern rainforest and salt. Oh, there's nothing else like it. <laughs> they need to bottle that and turn that into some kind of clone. I think you'd be smell like a weirdo, but that's, that's one of my favorite smells on earth. People are actually doing that. People are actually uh, <laughs> perfumers that go out and, and they talk to people and they say, I really like this smell um, um, that I um, <laughs> experienced in a, in, a, in, a, in a library. And people try to mimic a fragrance. <laughs> Musky uh, with, book. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's being done. A lot of people also report that they really like the smell of, of um, when it, you know, what it smells like after rain. Yep. Yeah. 
I think that was an episode on Seinfeld. Kramer tried to come up with a cologne that smelled like the ocean. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a typical um, Kramer thing. <laughs> it's a typical Kramer thing, yeah. All right. Well, that's great. I love chatting with diff- with scientists about their super facts. We usually get derailed and that, that happened again, which is amazing. Um, I think everybody's laughing, listening along. Um, the last section of the podcast, we get to know our guests a little bit more outside of what they study. Um, and you have uh, your passion or your your cause has to do with the well-being of non-human animals. W- would you like to talk to us about that? Yeah, so it, it's, it's pretty much everything that I like to do, I realized is uh, coming down to trying to improve the quality of life for non-human animals. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't care at all about humans, but I just think that... Um, non-human animals deserve a little bit more attention because they, they also have a really hard time. Um, but I, like I mentioned with the, you know, creating walls at home, I really like to try to turn our, our home, our house into a cat paradise. It's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. I like to, um, the, the little bit of land that we have uh, when we, when we bought the house, I like to, um, work on it, trying to, uh, recreate the, the, the natural habitat for our local wildlife and I like to do scientific research, um, like you know, evidence-based veterinary medicine, uh, high-quality animal science, um, all with the goal that you know some non-human, non-human animals will, at some point, benefit from it and and increase the quality of life for them. Hmm. It's such an admirable goal. Um, when you spend any length of time with any kind of creature, you just come to respect them right especially like the ones we've chosen to be our companions uh like i i am learning more about cats because we just got a cat but like i've always had such the such a great love for dogs and just like the i don't think humans have treated dogs very nicely sometimes and uh that's something that our account tries to change is to make people think about you know dogs are they've got a big brain they they have emotions, so we need to treat them a lot better. So I'm right oh, there with you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you know, dogs are man's best friend. So imagine how how humans have been treating all the other animals. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, there's and very few, we, there's very few animals that live in our house, and we dote on them like babies, like cats and dogs. Yeah. Yeah, and cats are are still very very much um, misunderstood animals. Yes. So it's there's there's a lot to um, you know to to learn about them and also to 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 teach people about about cats. Yes. A, um, a, lot of, a lot of people say that cats are um, small dogs that need less attention. You know, they're they're more independent. Uh, I can I can guarantee you um, that. When I'm gone next month for uh, a conference that I'm attending abroad, uh, most of the cats are going to be extremely upset. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, they miss their people. Absolutely. They yeah. show it in different ways sometimes, though. They're just, you know, they're different creatures. So, of course, they show things in different ways, but they're affected by the the, the humans they're bonded with. Yeah. yeah. I think um, that point you made was really important. I looked at something on the podcast oh a year ago about the 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 vast discrepancy in the number not discrepancy but the vast inequality or I guess like in, inequality is a good word between the scientific research being done on done on cats versus dogs. Mm, yeah, right? like for every one study done on a cat, there's fifty done on dogs or even a hundred. So yeah, you're, yeah, you're, um, and and there are such similarities between a cat and a human we always like that's the thing the study was trying to say is that we always think oh well what happens in a dog could happen in a human and we never stop to think about well what could happen in a a cat could happen in a human too so there's you know as we learn to understand cats better we learn to understand ourselves too so i'm right there with you more more (laughs) more study on cats (laughs) absolutely um, we're at the end of our chat chat thanks so much for talking to us today about catnip and all of the other types of things that also have similar effects on cats. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. You're very welcome. Thank you again for having me. I hope that um, at least one cat will benefit from it. Yeah. And Sebastian, before we go, can people follow you on social media? Like, do you have a website or links people could check out? Uh, yeah. If you if you Google Cowboy Cat Ranch, uh, you should be able to find us um, on Twitter or the website. 
And if you have any questions about any of the research that we've done or any other questions about cats or whatever, um, if I can answer or if I can help in any way, I'll be more than willing to do so. Nice. Okay, we'll make sure as many of those links are in the show notes as possible. So folks listening at home, all you have to do is click the hyperlinks. Okay, take care of yourself, Doc. Thanks for chatting. Have a great day. Thank you so much. You too. Okay, it's time for story time with me, Adam. Apparently Bunsen too. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. Um, Dad, do you have a story? I have a disgusting story. It is gross. We were taking Bunsen and Beaker on our normal walks out throughout the the fields and through the forests. And Bunsen noticed something in the grass. And when Bunsen stops to investigate, you know, something's up. And I was like, oh, there's something there. There's something there. And then there was commotion because it looked like he was rolling. Now, it was it was in the tall grass. So I'm trying to get there as fast as I can. Chris is trying to get there as fast as she can, but get, who who joins Bunsen? Beaker. Now I tell Bunsen to stop it and he goes away, but Beaker is throwing herself at abandon at whatever's in the grass. And it turns out it's like five prairie chicken eggs, huge prairie chicken eggs. And they are rotten. They've been abandoned. This is very sad, but Beaker was rolling in them and two popped. Like imagine finding an Easter egg that you didn't hard boil like from Easter in August. That's literally what this was like. And it popped and it got all over her and it was so stinky and so gross. The beaker had to have an impromptu bath outside our house. Chris threw me some shampoo and I shampooed her and I sprayed her down because she was incredibly disgusting. That's my story for Um, this week. They're still a little bit stinky. A little bit. They're still they're still stinky. Uh-oh. Okay. Oh my goodness. No. Okay. Um, I have a story. And um hold on. Let me remember my story. Actually, my story is about my cat. You might hear her, she's meowing. Um, but my cat this morning, sorry. Just for context, this morning I had to wake up early because it's my first day of band again. Um, And I woke up pretty early because mom had to leave for a workout. So we had to leave a bit earlier than usual. That's all good. So I woke up a bit earlier than usual. I had a shower and, you know, got ready for the day. And then Ginger came downstairs into the room where she usually gets fed, which is the laundry room. Um... And then I'm like, oh, yeah, there's no food down here. So I went upstairs and went into the room and shook the bag and I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear her. So I shook it even louder and then I called her name and I didn't hear her again. And I was worried that, oh, no, did she get like stuck down there? Um, No, I <laughs> called her a name one more time. She comes running up the stairs and then she looks uh, in the wrong direction. And she waits and then I shake the bag again. She looks right at me. And then she does like a Tokyo drift and like does a little spin. It was so funny because she was she was moving so fast. Um, she does a little drift. Yeah, she does drifts when she's moving super fast because her paws are like super fluffy and she doesn't get like all of the traction. It's like Bunsen when he's running. He does drifts too. <laughs> he drifts. Yeah. But because he's a massive bus, he can't stop himself. So he just drifts no, into you. He drifts into guests as they come into the house. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my story. Uh, Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. Um, if anybody has any ideas about where Bunsen and or Beaker would have hidden Adam's Birkenstock, I would really appreciate any direct messages um, because Buns or because Adam's Birkenstock one shoe is lost and the dogs are not helping me find it. Oh no! I know. So it's been a very busy week this week. Um, Adam did have early morning band. So band has started up and yesterday the Royals had started up and it's been a really, really busy week with lots of extracurricular. Um, So that has meant less time with the dogs. But yesterday... 
Jason said, hey, can we go for a quick walk before uh, you have to take Adam to Royals? And I said, absolutely. So we got everybody ready and we're good to go. And Bunsen was looking a bit mischievous. And I said, Bunsen, why do you have that cute mischievous look on your face? Anyway, we go outside. And if you're not aware, we have chickens. And Bunsen is always on the lookout for where the chickens are because he likes to look at the chickens and find out where the chickens have been. Because where the chickens have been means that there's poop, which is so disgusting. Gross. But it's our reality now. So I said, okay, we're going to go. And what we've been doing is we've been taking the dogs on leash until we get around the uh, the fence that Jason made out of slabs of wood. And uh, so we did that. And I was walking with Bun Bunsen. He was right behind me. And then he went off into the bush or into the into the grass. And I waited for him. And I'm like, Bunsen, you're looking kind of weird. You're looking like, that's not like a pooping face. You're just, what are you doing? Are you just smelling the wind? What is going on? And I looked at him and he looked at me and he was smiling and I'm like, okay. And then I thought, well, let's go forward. I took two steps forward and Jason said, he's gone. So he deked me out. He wanted to go look for chicken poop. And so he ran back home. And so I followed him home and then Beaker followed me home. And then Jason was stuck on the hill all by himself with no walk and no dogs. So th that's what happened yesterday and yep. Jason was upset because Jason really likes that time it's a really great time to walk and decompress after the day and walk with the dogs it's a wonderful time yep but they Bunsen both had ran other home to check out the chickens yeah Bunsen had other plans so he foiled your plans and my plans because I was going to go for a walk too but that didn't happen so that's my story okay so that's it for story time um yeah, I hope to see you guys on the next podcast episode. Um, you know, where we, we might be we might do mailbag, we might do story time, who knows. Uh, but I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Well, that's the end of another science podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to us. Special thanks to Dr. Sebastian Ball who talked to us about catnip and also behind the scenes has sent us a whole bunch of catnip and catnip-like plants to test on Ginger for some fun social media stuff. I'd also like to give a shout-out to our top-tier members of the P3 community. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without them, and there's so much fun stuff coming down um, for all of our community members. All right, Chris, let's hear their names. GBLB, Tracy Domague, Anne, Julie Smith, Sharon Dotson, Andrew Lynn, Elizabeth Parmente, Peggy McKeel, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Chris Kelly, Leela Periello, Sam, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Jody Ogren, Mary Ryder, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coops, Marianne McNally, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, Ben Rathert, and Bianca Hyde. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh. <laughs>